morning break. We were continuing in the debate of the second reading. The leader of opposition had debated and had concluded one hour of debate. He has one hour remaining. And I'll recognize him to continue his debate. I'll ask all other members to please make their way inside the chamber. Once you get in your seat, uh, I will entertain that interjection, Honorable Leader. I recognize the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Madam Speaker, I see you have a quorum now. I was saying earlier that we didn't have a quorum, but we have one now. Please proceed, Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as I said <clears throat> before we took the break, I had sat and listened to the Premier chastise me on what he has even called mangling of the relationship. Well, as I said before, it should be a shame to talk about mangling relationship. And in fact, those who write it for him too should be ashamed. I'm still waiting, though, to hear from him what it was I'd done to mangle this relationship they claim we held with the FCO. In my opinion, what I did was to stand up to the Foreign Office when they wanted to push us into taxation because they thought they had us conquered when this present premier broke the public management and finance law and the FCO took control of the budget process. At that time, Madam Speaker, they also told me that no way was there going to be any more projects without their explicit permission about $10 million because we could not afford what was already contracted. In fact, what they were doing then, Madam Speaker, in those early days, was indicating their intentions to introduce the FFR. Of course, our aims and objectives, Madam Speaker, will always be different than theirs. You can't blame them for wanting to protect the city of London. No. That's their job. But it's also my job to protect the Cayman Islands where I can. So if that's what the Premier talks about, bad relationship, well, they can go ahead. I'm never going to let them nor anyone else where I can. Let them have their way with us and run us into the ground. No, I'm sorry, I can't. Now, what I and the FCO agreed was that there would be no more borrowing. That was the fiscal plan that we agreed on, part of the fiscal plan that we agreed on, and is still in place up to today. So they go ahead about mangling relationships. Maybe that runs well with some that want to hear it. Maybe it runs well with some in the UK. What I need the Premier and all to know, Mickey Bush is no puppet. I'm not looking for any knighthood. And what I specifically want them to know is that McKeever Bush is not Robert the Bruce. Madam Speaker, I believe that the policy statement was against the good practice and custom of our parliamentary operation. 
on the state opening because it was laced with personal attacks and invective. Discrediting me, my UDP government, where they could, where they tried to, but in the end, he tried to temper the address by saying that he would not be distracted by political stunts and side shows. He said that he would go back to the days of, he would not go back to the days of personality politics and a government focused on self-aggrandizement and political survival. And I'm not sure how he could say all that when so much percentage of the speech was doing just that. I'm always amused at how far the premier will go to start a quarrel and then declare that he didn't start anything and was merely defending himself. I've heard that just a while ago. You wouldn't got to call their name. You wouldn't got to refer back to them and they believe that they're untouchable. They can say all that they have to say. And then as soon as you say something back to them, you're being personal. Madam Speaker, that's not how debate goes. You raise a matter, it's likely to get dealt with. They must expect that. And don't think that people don't have information. They don't think that their life so guarded, that they are so protected that there is not information. Time will see. Let them go ahead. But let me bring that wandering, delusional mind back to reality. I don't understand this, Madam Speaker. You have to, to, to make the corrections and you have to say what is the what the facts are. Was it not the Premier who went outside of this Honorable Legislative Assembly to hold mock Parliament while this Honorable House was in session right out there on our steps? Isn't that a political stunt and sideshow? Personality politics, it seems all they know. That's all it has ever been for them. Matter of fact, that's why they are Premier today because they tried to destroy me politically, but it has not worked. It has not worked. But I tell you, Mr. Premier and others, your report of my death has been grossly exaggerated. The Bible speaks at length about the reward of those who plot evil. Talk about the politics of all. Let me tell you what John F. Kennedy said. And he said this, let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. May we say the Cayman Islands? Liberty. We are opposed, he went on, by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covert means for expanding its sphere of influence on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of election, on intimidation instead of free choice. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. End of quote. This is not the politics of old, Mr. Premier. This has always been the dirty on the belly of politics, which some politicians continue to play and would prefer that we forget about and would like to see me gone and not be able to reply. As I said, your report, your report, your report of my death has been grossly exaggerated. That's why we have all these various people that when you take notes, you got you got to answer every little thing. So what do you think if they had, Madam Speaker, many ministries that I had to have because of not having enough cabinet ministers. These
Jesus, God, he would have had the house with half full of people then. If he, if he had had the four ministries that I had. But anyway, Madam Speaker, let me move now to a more positive matter. Tourism. Madam Speaker, I would want to speak positively about such achievements that the Premier would have you believe he and his government have achieved. The interesting fact is, if it, wasn't act, if it was actually true, I might actually have reached across the aisle in a different way. I find it of particular interest as they have lauded their government's efforts and is speaking of how great they are doing, especially when you look at one of the main pillars being tourism. I state how they dare claim credit. Oh, no doubt the ministry is working on giving credit for the working. But they didn't lay that ground provision. They didn't lay the foundation. The policies were there. And I thank you for keeping them in the game. We push the boulder with strategy, policy, and the sweat on our brow to the top of the hill. The Premier took the election to that action, which will be revealed soon enough, and now has stood by and watched the boulder roll down the hill. He has the audacity to claim credit and beat his chest and with this what they claim is their achievement. I don't think I would have to remind the amnesia that seems to be in abundance so early. I didn't think so. Yes, I state early, even though it's been half of their term, as I was sorely waiting for some significant movement of projects put forth that I could talk about a few. However, nothing has materialized must call his ghost action to account. As they seem to have been asleep during my government's last term, after he ran up the tab we couldn't pay, they must have dozed off for four years. And I wish they had. That way we would have been better off rather than the disruption he helped cause. He ran havoc with our accounts and the budget which left us at the peril in the joys of the UK. We understand that. Now they want to claim responsibility for tourism successes. I had to revisit my past government's policy decisions and notes in order to remind of the following. And let me Treat that amnesia a little. When his government left office, 2005, we were down double digits. 2009, that is. We were down double digits as much as 10% at the end of 2009 for stayover arrivals. But true strategies that we collaboratively worked with the tourism sector to develop, we increased the rival some 30%, or close to a third increase from 2010 through to 2013. As they should also note, plans and projects have a cumulative effect that will carry forward at least a year and a half, or maybe more. So my government can easily claim the record stay over arrivals, which we achieved for 2014, especially as they simply followed what my government put in place. As is well documented, due to the present Premier's brick and mortar, he left us a serious predicament. As it related to tourism, we had to make the tough, right decision of downsizing the tourism operation. We painstakingly parted ways with a vast amount of long-tenured U.S. staff members, 
and closed three physical offices in the U.S. as one measure to reduce costs. And we actually got the budget down from some 27 or 29, I think, million dollars to just about 19 or, or, or so. So don't say that we didn't work to reduce costs. We did. We brought the budget down from what's been close to 30 million, 29 plus, I think, to something like 19. So our, our strategy had to be clear and concise. And we allowed the, the young energetic team at Tourism, headed by Mr. Shamara Scott, to find out, or to find, I should say, out of the box methods to deliver the results we so desperately needed. As a reminder, we reduced tourism budget, as I said, by a third while increasing tourism arrivals by almost the same. This way, in the face of when the Caribbean was down, this is in the, in the face of when the Caribbean was down, in regards to visitor arrivals, and the world figures remain negative or flat for the most part. As an example, one of our policy decisions was to reinvigorate relationships and, and target increased air routes. And with that strategy, Madam Speaker, we have additional air service from five cities with different airlines all within that three-year period. Such routes as New York City, D.C., Toronto, Panama, Sao Paulo, and Dallas. Or, or Panama and Dallas. But we also opened four markets in three years with uh, Buenos Aires. Panama, Sao Paulo, and Dallas also. And that aggressive approach was the most ever, which helped to bring tourism arrivals back to the healthy numbers the premier across there now boasts. So, Madam Speaker, understanding the viability of the industry, we looked to diversify. We increased airlift from Canada to reduce independence or dependence on the U.S. We strategically opened up Latin American markets in order to seed the foundation to have other target markets to not be as dependent on U.S. markets in five to seven years. I think that's good forward think, thinking or, or planning. We injected Caymanian culture and soul back into how potential visitors see and view the Cayman Islands in order to give the Cayman Islands life and vibrancy through the rebranding or rather recapturing of what makes Cayman so special. Cayman kind. Cayman kind. We no longer are that vanilla destination in the minds of potential visitors. I would like to remind of all, all the naysayers that I am ecstatic that now Cayman Kind is the fabric of our beloved Cayman Islands, and the brand has also been proven through the many awards it has won. So to further elaborate, Madam Speaker, the projects which our government had the foresight to start was, was projects such as the 4 Cayman Alliance, which we, we said already, to be able to bring another quality four or five star brand to continue to build on our higher spending clientele. That's what that's all about. And many other tourism properties in the future as our room stock was so desperately in need of additional hotel rooms. We were down. Still, still is down. The, the Beach Bay Hotel project, which we hope will get on the way, will invigorate, I think, the eastern districts. Bring much business in the tumble. Go east. That's solid go east. Not like what they had before. Only little cook rum on the beach in Tarbo go, go east. This can bring real money. The people up there. The doctor. Sherrick, I guess, I guess you're right. The, the, the Sherrick Hospital on Cayman Islands Health City, as it is officially known, and, and for which I see the premier is now clamoring to pretend as if he supported from the beginning. Yes. My in training, my government understood that 
If we improve tourism, it would all be for naught if there was not enough access for our people. We therefore developed the hospitality school. In doing so, we took a different tactic, and instead of heavily weighting the, the council with civil servants or, or rewarding cronies with a board council position, we strategically put the employers and the council, the general managers of the major hotels, the general managers of the major restaurants and water sport companies. And then we then included immigration from a government perspective in order to ensure connectivity between all parties. And those professionals were tasked with forming the standards and curriculum for the school and would then see the progression of students and have a, a vested interest in the program and its ancillaries. And at the end of, of, of that program, how could any of the major properties then and stakeholders deny those who pass their industrial standards a chance at a career in one of the pillars of our society. So that was a good plan. Understanding the importance the youth will play in the, in the future of our society, the government had earmarked funds to help this program flourish. I, however, have fought, unfortunately heard the stories of the lack of funding that is strangling this program to, prior to its blooming and prospering. I hope not. So let's get this straight. We brag of surpluses, whilst we drop dynamite on the real tracks to the desired goals. Don't say that the money was that I said it over and often and went to the industry. I am putting increasing money, increasing duty on the imported liquor and cigarettes. They warn me about cigarettes, because I say they can go to five or ten dollars a pack, I say, I hope it goes to twenty five dollars. I should put it up more than that. But you know what happened? That not stop cigarettes from, from going up. People still smoking. I should have gotten more out of it. But I said the money from that would go from the imported liquor and the imported cigarettes would go to the hospital to school. It was earmarked for that. I said that over and often. In the budget debate, I said so. In the finance committee, I said so. To the industry, who reluctantly, I should say, took it on. Nobody happy about the increase, but they reluctantly took it on. So I hope, Mr. Minister, that you're getting the lion's share, that if not all of it, to the hospitality training school, and at least as much as is needed to make it grow and take on what it was meant to do. Did study. Think of how about he started it? You just heard me stand in the last ten minutes telling you how it was starting. You can talk. You started. No, no, started. We started it. Don't you worry. I'm not taking credit for this building. I didn't start this building, but I started our program. I started our program. I put the council in place, put the money in place, and I wasn't there to launch. You didn't invite me to launch it. But I was, or for the launching, I was involved from the beginning. Let's hope it is what we hope, had the hope, high hopes for it. Let's hope it's that. You don't have to invite, invite me to anything. Yeah, that's right. You get, you get, a, you get a big rock in the head. Our government, Madam Speaker, allowed and worked with the tourism department to devise strategies with less budgets to increase visitation when the rest of the Caribbean was down. We, however, fought to have positive arrival results. Our government started new routes and used Cayman Airways as a tool to bring new visitors, as well as encourage such airlines as JetBlue and WestJet to fly to the Cayman Islands. It should have also been known that we, we started and had much conversation with American Airlines about the Dallas route. They mentioned a timeline, and that has come to fruition, Madam Speaker. However, I see that this government with, uh, will want to claim credit for that, too. 
Our government, Madam Speaker, was unapologetic in bringing the authentic Caymanian way back to the fore in our branding campaign and no longer hiding who, was, who, we, as, who we are as a nation and should be proud of. Our visitors, I think, are relishing and have even been celebrated in this identity. So we will get the Kemp Kempton Hotel at least. I don't know if we can get the Beach Bay Development, but we should be getting the Sherry Hospital and more. So I can speak now of the great indicators that we have from a tourism perspective. Record arrivals, high occupancy, a private sector that is ecstatic about the progress, a premier that is boasting of all his accomplishments, Maybe we should put a statue in front of all these monuments of his miseducation built. However, many skilled and unskilled educated and undereducated are struggling without a job, and that's what we need to remember in the tourism sector. Even feed our future is going strong. Madam Speaker, I am proud that we have worked hard on our tourism product and that we are bearing fruits from what we did. And I thank the minister for continuing that and hope that our tourism product can, can continue to be enhanced by the, the policies left in place uh, with the work that he puts into it at present. Madam Speaker, Health City Cayman has now completed its first full year of operation and as of last week achieved a much sought after Joint Commission International Certification, JCI. We congratulate them on this milestone achievement as we knew that in achieving the JCI, this would allow them to continue their expansion plans on a more rapid pace. On another note, Madam Speaker, I offer my congratulations to Health City on their efforts thus far to identify, hire, and train Caymanians as was originally agreed in their discussion uh, with us and was in the agreement with the government. We encourage creating, Madam Speaker, a high-tech working environment as was always envisioned as a cornerstone of Health City's plans. It then comes as no surprise that there are no major international IT companies which are desirous of par partnering in the development of the plans for Tech City Cayman Islands, which will be located in Health City. As part of Health City overall vision for creating a cutting edge medical center of excellence in the region and staying ahead of the, in of the inventions in the field of medicine, Tech City is a natural step towards this end. Madam Speaker, we are asking the government to pursue this new business opportunity of Tech City, urging them as this will once again create opportunities in the Cayman Islands, including new jobs in the technology se sector that will in turn lead to the creation of additional indirect and induced employment, opportunities in areas such as administration, professional services, hospitality, retail, etc., thereby further establishing the Cayman Islands as the destination choice. Again, that was part of the vision, new opportunities, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Tech City will function initially as a healthcare and technology incubator and accelerator for technology-focused, innovative healthcare products and services. Examples of healthcare products and services are tech-enabled mobile and broadband healthcare applications, patient care outsourcing services, remote medicine services, patient care call centers, and virtual healthcare training and education services. But we all know that this type of industry has no limits to its creativity, and our people on these islands will be the better off for it being established here rather than in a neighboring or competing jurisdiction. Madam Speaker, in summary, from what I know, my papers tell me, as 
Tax City is now showing some of the benefits that we spoke to. We believe that Tax City, Cayman Islands, will also benef greatly benefit the people of these islands as it will attract one IT enterprises in the, the healthcare sector. This includes both startups and established enterprises. Two IT enterprises more generally. It is expected that these enterprises would be focused on healthcare technology initially, but this could change over time as the technology sector develops. Three nearshore IT services enterprises operating mainly in the business process outsourcing, technology subsector, and four IP holding companies. Those companies may or may not be directly linked to the technology enterprises referred to above, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, in this world of competition, government needs to move on this innovative development. It can be bigger, I believe, than the potential of Health City itself. It has tremendous potential. And so, Madam Speaker, I want to turn now to Another area that I am, have been pushing, talking about, and, and had moved ahead on, I want to focus on, on two areas which I think is of necessity for the future. And that is one, to deepen uh, corporate capabilities to seize global opportunities. Madam Speaker, we must grow a diverse and resilient ecosystem of companies, including a stronger base of local companies with the potential to be leaders in the Americas region. It must also entrench Cayman as the essential base in not only the Caribbean, but all of the region for both MNCs and global SMEs. The MNCs remain, Madam Speaker, a critical part of our economy. They allow Cayman to stay plugged into the developed country markets, which will remain sizable for the foreseeable future. They also play a key role in developing Cayman as a hub for Pan America's management operations. And, and three main areas, I think, require special focus. First, we have to make a significant push to derive commercial value by promoting R&D. Businesses, Madam Speaker, can make much greater use of our on top technology base through both product and process innovation in areas ranging from biomedical technology to clean energy solutions. Our, our total R&D expenditure has to, to grow over the long term to secure our future as a knowledge-based economy. Over the next years, I think we, we sh should target to raise Cayman's expenditure on R&D to a fair percentage, let's say, uh, of the, the GDP compared to, to current expenditure, Madam Speaker. And that could be achieved through increased private sector R&D expenditure, I think. And, and we should also review ways to drive public sector R&D so as to, to catalyze private sector research and commercialization. Second, Madam Speaker, we have to develop the financing capabilities to take advantage of global opportunities and manage, I think, the inherently higher risk of these markets. Demand is growing rapidly in fields where Cayman-based companies have significant strengths such as in the financial services, industry, and tourism. But there are some gaps in cross-border financing capabilities in Cayman, including in trade and project finance. The, the government would, all, would help, or could help the market plug these gaps through private industry market-based solution and institution to provide the, the credit, insurance, guarantees, and other instruments needed to facilitate commercial bank financing. That, I think, will also protect Cayman's role as a leading global banking center. Maybe, maybe Madam Speaker, we're reaching some in this, but there's work yet that we could be done. Third, 
we would develop strong alliances between large and smaller players to promote technology transfer, test bidding, and commercialization, Madam Speaker. And that alliance will help the SMEs develop capabilities in the local market, which they can then deploy abroad. And that network of, of supply chain relationship, Madam Speaker, will also benefit the large foreign players, larger foreign players, and help root them, root them in Cayman. And so, Madam Speaker, those capabilities will provide new opportunities for government to diversify the tax base as well as provide greater support and assistance to our poor, our elderly, and our children. You see, Madam Speaker, for social programs to have the necessary financial support, we need to be more pro-business and welcome new cutting age businesses. And I tell the government, I, they might laugh at me strongly, I don't know what they will do, but I hope they don't just leave me here. But that way, we won't get anything done. So many people don't want to see this, don't want to see that, don't want to change. They want everything, but they don't want no changes. How in the world do you make that happen? I don't know. I don't know. Now, Madam Speaker, another aspect that I think is, is of Cayman is Cayman as a center of excellence. Cayman's future must rest, Madam Speaker, I believe, believe in being a global center of excellence. And some of the things we're doing, we're moving in that direction. But Hong Kong, Dubai, and Singapore are what they are, not because of the, the specific economic activities they conduct, but because people want to be there. And that too has to be Cayman's key advantage in the future. Being a distinctive destination and a meeting point here in America's for, for enterprise, people's talent, cultures, and ideas, which will be a source of competitiveness and growth in its own right. Madam Speaker, as I said, we can't be the dishwasher destination, nor, nor the salvation army to the whole world. We must continue to attract top quality people from around the world, even as we manage our overall dependence on foreign workers. We must do that. New competitor environments in the Caribbean, Madam Speaker, and beyond, are already staking their claims in the global knowledge-based economy. Why do you think Bermuda is doing away with their rollover policy? Why? Think about it. Our advantage lies in our ability to attract diverse and high-quality talent from around the world who must work alongside our Caymanian, their Caymanian peers, our people, and add to our capabilities. This must remain an enduring advantage and is a committed position of my party. We don't believe that you must stifle growth. We don't believe that we can give our people opportunity if we don't allow other people to come and help create opportunity. Where are we going to do it? Where are we going to get it from? Have to be an, a policy that allows people in. Sorry, the money now growing in the north side, now growing in the east end, now growing on trees in Bordentown, and now growing down, down in Boltons where I live. Now, up at Seven Mile Beach, no, the money now growing there. The money is somewhere else and it's coming to us and we must utilize it and allow people to bring it and utilize it. And that's what the old people of old did, our forefathers in this house, if you want to say that. They protected Caymanians, though. They gave us some rights. Not everybody was protected. Now, don't let anybody fool the kid up with that. Yeah, well, I tell you, because I done told you that there were far too many who couldn't get education, right? Nevertheless, we grew. We made it better. So don't let these people and they say, tell you that we don't need people here and, we, and you, you must be back in the 1560s. Oh, yeah? But who wants to be by a cook room? Let them go and be by a cook room. I want my air conditioning. I want to go in a good kitchen and a good dining room and sleep without the fear of rain coming in on you. That's what we had when we were growing up. We cannot go back to that. And the way to do it is to allow people to come and invest and we be welcoming. So, Madam Speaker, yes, as this 
distinctive global destination, we will also see enterprising Caymanians venture overseas for part of their careers as their companies expand abroad and as demand for their skill grows. But Cayman must remain their home, the current, the country they feel emotionally rooted to. So wherever they may be, in Cayman or abroad, we need to engage our people. Their commitment, their ideas, their skills, and hard work will, will continue to be our greatest strength to realize our potential. We must focus more in several areas. First, we must grow the knowledge-based economy that will continue to make Cayman that distinctive global center. We must develop thriving creative and art clusters distinguished for both their development of, of Caribbean content and appeal to an international audience. We should also aim to continue host more uh, global events, building on the, the vibrancy of the islands. We must provide the best opportunities in Cayman for diverse talents to grow and develop. Our workforce will become even better educated over the next decade, uh, by 2020 we hope and beyond. A good percent of our resident workforce is protected or projected to possess at least a diploma, I think including 35% holding degrees and maybe higher. I'm not sure if that's in keeping with what the ministry sees. But this, this is a comparable to the leading GAs today. And, and Madam Speaker, however, we have to, to complement the academic roots of advancement with a, a range of new practice-based pathways to excellence. We have to, to build deeper expertise across the board, whether amongst our marine engineers, our attorneys, our construction workers, or our finance professional chefs and tour guides, and other tourism workers. Cayman will be, uh, we, mu we must ensure that Cayman will be a center for thought and practice leadership, Madam Speaker, in our key areas of uh, specialization. These are some thoughts, Madam Speaker, that I believe are important to where we need to go. Madam Speaker, I, in opening earlier, stated that Caymanians need to decide what it is they truly want. Now, Madam Speaker, I need to ask, what is it we as representatives want for them? I can speak for the, the UDP in this Honorable House and elsewhere, Madam Speaker. I have often said that our people need to make up their mind. What is it they are looking for in the future of the Cayman Islands? We must know they must have work. We know that. That they must live in a crime-free country with a safe future with opportunities for their children and grandchildren. We must be able to take care of our elderly and provide on, entrepreneurial opportunities or entrepreneurial opportunities for our Caymanian people. The UDP is certainly about, excuse me, about a uni, unified Cayman. We are about getting back to what made us successful, Madam Speaker. We recognize that we have no natural resources, no mountains, no rivers, we have no minerals, we have no oil or bauxite. All we ever had and what has made us come ahead is being a good people. That's what has made us come ahead. The world, though, has changed today. But if we are willing, as Caymanians, if we are willing to make some adjustments and bring in businesses and be welcoming and understand that we, as of now, are not our own masters, we know that the world, Madam Speaker, controls our money. As I said, it's, no, 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 we don't print no money down here. We're not growing on no trees. We know that the world controls our money, the banks, the hedge funds, the reinsurance, the companies registered here, and the hotels, and that the world is our tourism, and that really, Madam Speaker, we are dependent on the world. Let us not forget that. Let us not forget to preach it, even the premier, has picked up on that as much as he's kicked me in the face about immigration and so on. Even to him has picked up on it. We are dependent 
on the world, then, Madam Speaker, if we can recognize who has helped us get the good homes, get the good education, the good standard of living we enjoyed over the last 50 years, and realize that it wasn't the statements that the Premier makes or any politician makes right now, and that he has done nothing for our success. However, Madam Speaker, the social benefits, the seamen and elderly benefits, the scholarships for our children did not come just now. But in spite of them, they did not come with them, but in spite of them, we have survived. Honorable Leader of the Opposition, you have 15 minutes remaining. 15? Yes, sir. Thank you kindly. There are some who still exercise good conscience. You know that? And know what humanity is. We can realize that. There are some who do that. I know my good friend, the, the first member from Bordentown, me and him served together in cabinet. And he knows the work, feels the compassion for people, understand the need of people, and are willing to put out his hand to help people. We, I, can, I can relate to him. Because we know that we have to help our people. We know that. So, yes, there are some who still exercise good conscience and know what humanity is. And we can realize that we will always need a government but it must be one who cares enough for the people to give those benefits while we work to build islands as our people did in the past. If all that is comprehensible, then yes, we can and will have a better life in the future. Yes, I desire, Madam Speaker, long been I've been talking about it from the first time I entered that red of first seat down there in 1984. I said that. We want to be the Singapore of the Caribbean. And we can be the diverse community living in unity where progress is not measured by what party is in or what it calls itself, but measured, Madam Speaker, by the quality of life in these islands for all our people. Let us not be fooled. By the gimmickry, where is the evidence of the benefits for the people and their families' survival? Talk is cheap, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, someone said to me at prayer breakfast the other morning, said, we as leaders, we must have the courage the courage to stand up for those who don't have the power. And they said that the tragedy of a country is not that mistakes are made. We are human, all of us here. The tragedy of a country is not that mistakes are made, but that there is a refusal to learn from our mistakes and those of others. Madam Speaker, I could go on much more. It was said that I could kneel. No, I will sit. I will invite all members to our public meeting tonight at Marina Drive in Prospect. I'm going to deal with that thing called one man, one vote. We're going to publish our man, our um, petition against it because we believe, Madam Speaker, no matter what, that it's not a good good life. Many people thought it was the best thing to have. I know that some of my colleagues in there have their deep, hardened opinions about it. But no, Madam Speaker, I certainly will not support it. I cannot support dividing this country up anymore, Madam Speaker. No. That cannot be the kind of participatory democracy we want. And the Premier knows that. He knows that. It is amazing, Madam Speaker, how less than two years ago the now Premier 
then leader of the opposition did not support one man, one vote. And there was an entire war of words between the chair of C4C, whom some of his, now is his coalition partners, and over, over the same thing. But all of a sudden, for temporary political expediency, he has made a 180 degree shift in his position. Are you telling me, Mr. Premier, that members of the C4C are now influencing a decision to disregard the will of the people and change the process that has been in place for over 185 years and serve the islands well? I see this, and I say it, history will record that my party and I were again right if you decide to implement one man, one vote. Why for once, Mr. Premier, can't you and I publicly be seen to do the right thing for the thousands of people who have put their confidence in us and voted for us? You see, Madam Speaker, the Premier knows what I'm saying is correct. You know that you don't really support this change. But it appears as though his party and perhaps even his conscience has been hijacked. I don't know. I will stand with him, though. And we'll defend the position, our position, as it relates to one man, one vote. We seldom see eye to eye on much, but you know in the deepest chambers of your conscience, Mr. Premier, that we are both right in our objection to one man, one vote, and single member constituency. I will continue to fight against one man, one vote, because it will bring more polarization in the country lead to more separation in our communities and districts, and certainly increase the cost of operating the government. So, no, can't agree. I'm not going to agree. But we will have to abide by democracy and whatever the government do. After we put out the petition, Madam Speaker, that we circulate, we will see whether they will pay any attention to that. Madam Speaker, yes. We live in a good Caymanian community. We live in a good island. These are good islands, Madam Speaker. Our people have worked hard. Our forebears have worked hard to build this place up. Yes, we know we can't please everybody. But certainly, Madam Speaker, we have to work as much together as we can even with our differences, to ensure that we continue building a stronger foundation. Thank you kindly. We'll now break for lunch, and we will reconvene at 2.15 p.m.